welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. I'm Martin Smith and Walter Fight. Hi, Martin. Hi, Walter. Are you doing well? Well, the world is in uproar, so we must be doing fine. Oh, we're still going on. <laughs> Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we have these discussions, and it's a little bit of a break in between the chaos in the world. So enlighten our minds, help the discussion, and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, there are so many people who want to talk about Russia, Ukraine. Is this a north-south issue of Daniel? And uh, we've been watching the situation for some time, but, uh, you know, we didn't want to jump right in and jump to confusions. Yeah. We would prefer some conclusions. <laughs> so let's look at it and let's approach it carefully and try and see if we can fit it into the prophetic picture. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is something that concerns people. Yes, and there's a lot of voices out there with different scenarios and uh, putting it together. But Yes, so nobody, I think, has an absolute answer. So let's not be arrogant about this. Let us be open to ideas, suggestions, and uh, look at it with a cool mind. Yes, because we're not out there to say that we know everything. No, absolutely not. We're all on a road yeah. and we're looking through a glass darkly. Exactly. Well, here's a statement to start off with. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Now, this was written quite a while ago, of course, but nevertheless, the prophecies of the final events of Daniel 11 were still future. Yes. And uh, we're living in that future. So it's good to look at it again and again. I have given some lectures on it in the past and I haven't really changed my mind greatly about it, but uh, we must look at it and see whether we can expand or improve. Oh, we've even done a few um, episodes uh, two years ago on this subject as well. On the North-South issue. The south issue. And it's important and still when, while we're doing this discussion as well, like you said, to keep an open mind. Because it's not cast in stone yet. No, nothing is cast in stone. And this statement from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 268, I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, want, famine, pestilence were abroad in the land. We do have, have all of these recipes for this cake, don't we? Yep. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me and again everything was in the utmost confusion. Strife, war, bloodshed, famine, pestilence raged everywhere. Is this a possibility that we're talking about the world wars and then a final conflict? Well, it, if that is the case, the scenario fits. The scenario fits, and we move from the Second World War, which was a world war, but really it was very localized. Yes, Europe, yes. and maybe Japan, and a little bit in America, but... A little bit here, a little no. bit there. But here it says everywhere. That's a big word. Mm. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. So that puts it beyond a shadow of doubt that you know, it's not just a European issue, uh, etc. It is a universal issue. War caused famine. Want and bloodshed caused pestilence. And then men's heart failed them for fear and for looking after those things which were coming on the earth. Now, Martin, what makes people afraid? Something that they don't know. And something that looks so ominous that survival seems a remote possibility. 
And uh, would, would uh, pestilence qualify? Yes. yes. Would a nuclear war qualify? Definitely. Okay. And the, even the threat of nuclear war is already giving the, that fear. Now, I find it interesting that the Bible in Matthew 24 speaks about rumors of war. Mm. And rumors of war seem to be a very prominent feature, right? It is. But and it's casting fear the whole time. Yes, yeah, so there is war, but the rumor of war is the one that is casting the fear. It's, it's almost as if it's worse off in the beginning because eventually when it happens, it's almost as if the rumors have desensitized you. All right. So let's just look at a few verses here from Daniel 11 because that was our introduction that this prophecy is going into fulfillment. So the king of the north versus the king of the south. Now we're actually not living in these verses right here. We're living a little bit later. and We'll come to those verses that come after these. But there's an interesting or very important principle that we find here. Namely that both of these kings, the king of the north and the king of the south, hearts shall be to do mischief and they shall speak lies at one table. Mm. That's a very important clue. Very important. You cannot take this away because you're going to fall into a trap if you don't adhere or listen or take attentive attention to this part. So here we have two adversaries, and they're speaking lies, and they're speaking lies at one table. Mm. So they appear to be adversaries, but they're actually sitting at one table. Mm -hmm. So the populace is being fooled. Now, this you would call a conspiracy theory, but this is a biblical mm -hmm. conspiracy theory of biblical proportions. Mm -hmm. All right? What happens then? But it shall not prosper. What shall not prosper? Obviously, the mischief. Mm. Hmm? Their plans. The plan shall not prosper, although they might appear to prosper. Mm. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. In other words, they will lose their power. Can we assume that this is a global game where people are being lied to by two supposedly opposite parties that sit at the same table? Yes. That's How would you arrange that? Wouldn't you uh, say that secrecy is of the utmost importance? Mm -hmm. Everything has to happen in darkness and only what they want you to see is up in, the op in the open air. So you think secret societies will be involved? Mm -hmm. We have many statements in the spirit of prophecy that they are involved and that we should have nothing to do with them, right? So people that say this is a conspiracy will really have to do some explaining because this is very conspiratorial. Now we need to find out what this mischief is mm. and why the charade. Why? Obviously the charade is to get the mindset of the people through the lies attuned to a particular plan. Mm. And that particular plan involves mischief. Hmm? Yes, deceit. Yes, all right. So at the time appointed, he shall return and come towards the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. We're dealing with the historic issue. But this prophecy also has a future fulfillment, as we saw in that quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. Mm. Just like Matthew 24 had a then time future fulfillment. Now, what is the story here? For the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. And so shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. This is a very serious issue. So the ships of Kittim, does that imply that economic issues will be paramount? Yes, definitely. It will be in turmoil. It'll be in turmoil. There will be an economic, oppressive 
condition that will cause people to, or the powers that be, to come to some kind of conformity so that they can perform mischief. But it's very important that the mischief is against the Holy Covenant. This is not only a worldly or secular occurrence. This is a religious thing as well. All right, so there's a religious connotation. Mm. And the ones who are involved in the mischief are those that have forsaken the Holy Covenant. So would you imagine that the Antichrist would fit very well into that picture? Definitely. I think he will be the leader. He will be the kingpin, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's the master of uh, those that have forsaken the Holy Covenant. He is called the Antichrist. Yeah. All right. So let's unpack it a little further. And arms shall stand in his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily, let's just call it daily, for they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. So we have a very religious aspect here. Mm. Arms shall stand in his part. He has military power behind him. He controls military power. Yeah. Now, Martin, I have a question. If they're all sitting at one table... Do you think that he might control both sides of the military power? I'm sure he does. Does this sound like a logical conclusion? Yes. Okay. That would be very intriguing and very conspiratorial, and I'm sure some will shout conspiracy. But this is what it says here, right? Exactly. Okay. So he has arms that stand on his part. Now, how is he using that power that he has? He's using it to pollute the sanctuary of strength. Now, we've dealt with the sanctuary. The sanctuary basically is the plan of salvation in type. Yeah. Hmm? That was the heavenly one and then the earthly one showing towards what Christ will do. All right. So if he pollutes the sanctuary, then he is polluting the plan of salvation. He's putting something in the place of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Yes, it. And he is diverting the attention from the plan of salvation into some other thing. Could it be something like social justice, for example? Mm -hmm. Now, what does that all entail? Uh, he shall take away the daily. Now, we can have a long discussion on the daily because sacrifice is added in the original. Now, some claimed that uh, this was a reference to pagan Rome being removed and then papal Rome coming in to power. Be that as it may, let's not get too involved in the daily, otherwise we'll digress here. But whatever it is that they're doing here, they will get to the point where they place the abomination that makes desolate. Yes. Now, what is that? That was the Roman standard that was placed around Jerusalem. Right? It, yeah. it was a pagan standard. And it was the pagan standard of their power and their authority. Mm. Does the papacy, the Antichrist system, claim to have a standard of its power and authority? Yes. Sunday. Sunday. Mm -hmm. They say it quite clearly. They say it is a mark. The fact that we've moved the solemnity from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week Sunday is a mark of our ecclesiastical power. Yeah. If you want to know the strength of anybody, they have this sign or they have this one thing that shows it. And that is the one thing that shows that the Roman Catholic system has its authority and power. And once the world accepts that power, authority of the Roman system, then they will have polluted the sanctuary because they would have put a man who claims apostolic succession in the place of Jesus Christ. And he is the one that hands out salvation through his sacramental acts and by putting his fingers in the so-called treasury of merit.
Now, we've dealt with that in previous WhatsApp, so we're not going to deal with it. So the bottom line is, the king of the north and the king of the south sit at the same table. They plan mischief and they speak lies. And their mischief is with those who forsake the Holy Covenant and they will use military power to get what they want and they shall take away the daily and they shall place their mark of authority in the place of God's mark of authority. So this is a religious issue. That brings us now to what's happening between Russia and the Ukraine. Because there are some that feel that Russia, having been and still being a communist country, mm -hmm. is king of the south. Yes. Hmm? Because it's not relig religious. Correct. Then you have the king of the north, who happens to be the papacy. Now, this is how the pioneers saw it, that the king of the north was the papacy. And obviously, when uh, you read, for example, the book of Jeremiah, uh, where the enemy comes from the north, it was always a reference to Babylon, and the priest and the king of Babylon, he was the one that you had to bow down to. Yes. Now, he was the Pontifex Maximus. Later in history, when the Medo-Persians took over, this priesthood fled to Pergamum, and there it was established. And this title of Pontifex Maximus was then transferred to the Roman emperor as a gift by the last king of Pergamum, who was Attalus III. And then this gift was kept, but he had to have certain criteria. And one of them was that he had to be worshipped as God. Yeah. And Julius Caesar is the first one who took that title and the power to be worshipped as a God. And since then, the Caesars were gods. Now, who has that title, Pontifex Maximus, today? The Pope. The Pope. So he is the Roman heir of that title. Now, this is arrogance of the highest order. He is the king of Babylon, in other words. You can even see the acknowledgement of it in his Twitter account, at Pontifex. Yes. It's his Twitter account name. So he is taking that upon himself. He is taking that title upon himself. So we cannot divorce him from the equation. Now, we know that the Counter-Reformation has placed many different antichrists mm -hmm or future antichrists that are supposedly not here into the picture. But that's not the Reformation view. It never was, and it's not an Advent view either. Correct. And it doesn't actually fit in the biblical view. No. And you can't change history. No. So, Martin, let's just look at what some people are saying about this Ukrainian situation. And it's so interesting that involved in this are many celebrities, beauty queens, uh, actors. So let's have a look what this Ukrainian parliament member had to say. Uh, I'm saying here, along with my crew, we are members of the resistance and we are armed. So when you are saying she says that she's armed and ready to fight, I'm not only saying this, we are proving this actually by our actions. So Ukraine right now resisting very hard. Putin is not getting any wins of what he wanted. And for now, it's 4,300 Russian soldiers are being killed on Ukrainian soil. So I think it's like a pretty bad result for a dictator, right? I think if those numbers are accurate, this is obviously not what Putin expected so far. Uh, for the rest of us that aren't Ukrainians, I think the world, quite frankly, Kira, is surprised by the will of the Ukrainian people to stand up and fight. Are you? Well, I'm not surprised. I, uh, we have been fighting uh, Putin for the last eight years, and we had three revolutions in our country when we did not agree with what was going on with uh, the direction of where we're moving in. But right now, it's a critical time because we know that we not only fight for Ukraine, we fight for this new world order for the democratic countries.
We knew that we are the shield for the euro. We knew that we are protecting not only Ukraine, we are protecting like all the other countries that would be next if we fail. That's why we just cannot fail. Do you predict Ukrainian victory over Russia in this invasion? Absolutely. I have no other scenarios in my head. I see people, I see women like me bearing arms and standing up to protect their families, their cities, and their countries. There is no force in the world that could actually um, destroy us. Well, Martin, there are some interesting things that she said. They're not only fighting for Ukraine, they're fighting for the new world order. Yeah, and these democratic countries that make up probably NATO and all of this. And what was interesting for me is the part of the resistance. This is all sounds so dystopian movie-like. And I'm not trying to say that there's, it's not bad in anything, but the way that this was portrayed on here, there's a few things that's a little bit hard for me to, to swallow. Well, she said literally thousands of Russian troops have been killed thus far. And uh, this mighty war machine of Russia cannot crush this little country in a few days. That is a very strange scenario. And uh, they believe that they will have victory. They're practicing with the wooden guns. And uh, th there's a lot of talk about all the wooden guns and some people say this is all fake. There's no doubt that there's turmoil yeah. in Ukraine. There's no doubt that there are terrible situations. But whether the media is telling us the truth, that is another story. You see, that's why I'm trying to say this, because we don't want to come um, over as unsympathetic. No, no. That's the last thing I want to do. I really sympathize for all, and it's not a good thing that there's ever war. Just like you said, we have to look through the bigger picture and just put it into perspective. So if we look at the prophetic picture, here in the end, there is going to be a clash. It is a north-south clash. But they're sitting at the same table and they're planning mischief. That's together with those that are against the Holy Covenant. We know who they are. And the mischief in, involves deceit, and that will be, propaganda will fall part of that. Absolutely. All right. Now, what is the agenda here? You know, many people believe that Russia, together with communist China, that they portray absolutely the king of the south mm -hmm. because that is uh, communism it's atheism and that is what they stand for then the west they stand with the king of the north this is the idea that is out there and with that the king of the north stands for morality and the king of the south for immorality now that picture mm -hmm. to me martin does not fit. No. And I'll tell you why. Because in the type, in the original, there were two literal parties. The one was literal Babylon. Mm. That stood for the religio-political system. And that literal Babylon was against the king of the south that stood for literal Egypt. Mm. Once you move into the spiritual realm, you cannot apply physical nations to the prophetic picture. And the book of Revelation in chapter 11 makes it quite clear when it says spiritually Egypt. Yes. When this power that comes up from the bottomless pit, this final conglomerate, which belongs to this terrible beast that has never changed its colors no. really, when that comes up and rules then there's this supposed clash with a spiritual king of the south. Mm. So we're dealing with a mindset. Yeah. We're not dealing with nations. Now, once you make it nations, then your eyes are looking in a particular geographic area. Yes. And the religious world 
is doing exactly that. And we will show some videos of what the religious world believes. They believe this is all heading for a war with Israel. Yeah. Because that is the prophetic picture that they have, which comes from futurism, which is based on lies. In fact, Jesuitical lies. Mischief. Mischief. Mm. So let's try and get that out of our picture and say we're not dealing with countries. Mm. We're dealing with mindsets. mindsets. In the Middle Ages, who controlled morality? The papacy. Absolutely the papacy. Rigidly. Did they use the secular power to enforce their morality? Yes. Yes. The state had to enforce it. Since the French Revolution, did they lose that capacity to use the state to enforce their morality? Yes. It was called a mortal wound. That's it. Right? So they lost that power. But the mortal wound will be healed. healed. Mm. Now, Martin, the secularism, is it confined to nations or is it present in all nations? It's in all nations. Aha. Definitely. This king of the north mentality that we want morality to be controlled by a particular entity, call it the church, mm. is that in all nations? Yes. Yes. Well, Even in communist China. Exactly. Isn't the church underground but very active in China? Yes. Isn't the church active in Russia? Definitely very active. Isn't the church active in the Ukraine? Yes. Very much so, right? So you cannot say there is the enemy and here is the friend. It is, it is more diffuse than that. We're dealing with uh, a mindset. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with two ideologies that are going to clash here. The one they call the king of the north ideology, which is the religio-political system enforcing morality, a particular kind, under a particular authority, namely that of the papacy. Yes. And then you have the secularism. Now, if you take Joe Biden, he's a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. So you would call him a king of the north adherent. Yes. Does he have very secular, non-king of the north yes. ideologies? Correct. Non-moral. He's got some that's going contrary to what the actual king of the north sees as moral. All right. So is there a confusion because he's actually comprising both king of the north attributes and king of the south attributes? Yes. The bottom line is one of the mindsets must go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now she says they're fighting for Ukraine, but they're fighting for the new world order. Now, let's put that into perspective. Everybody is so afraid of the new mm. world order. What is the new world order? All right, it has, it has many components. It has economic components. Mm. Definitely economic components. But the new world order comprises giving the power of the state back to the church. That's it. That is the new world order. Because the Bible says the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. Was that power removed after the French Revolution? Yes. Will they give it back? Yes. Yes. So let's look at it from that perspective and that sort of sets the stage for uh, a discussion. Now Martin, here's a speech by Putin. And it's a very interesting speech because it sounds more as if the king of the north is speaking than the king of the south is speaking, right? Yes. Now, does this man have uh, nuclear capabilities? According to every old data, yes. Yes. So his finger is on the button. Has he been uh, quite vocal about it? Yes. Has he even threatened with it? He said that if anybody goes against him, they'll have more trouble than they've ever been in history. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. 
So, does this create fear for a possible third world war? Yes. Okay. So, let's listen to this speech and see what we can glean. To national identity is related to the global development. Here, they are related to moral and uh, geopolitical aspects. We witness many Euro-Atlantic uh, countries are refusing, forgetting their roots, including the values of Christianity, which form the basis of the civilization. They are renouncing any ethical basis, uh, any identity, national, religious, or even gender ones. They are following the policy which equals uh, uh, families with uh, many children and uh, one gender families. Excesses of uh, political correctness lead us when the parties uh, uh, pursue propaganda of pedophilia. Representatives uh, in many Western countries are afraid of mentioning their uh, gender. They even are cancelling some festivities and uh, they are hiding uh, the the basis of such festivities and they are trying to impose this model to anyone. I am convinced this lead, leads us to degradation and primitivization, to deep uh, moral crisis. <sighs> В большевики после революции 1917 года, опираясь на догмы марксизма э, Маркса и, и Энглиса, тоже объявили, что изменят весь привычный уклад. Не только политический и экономический, но и само представление о том, что такое человеческая мораль, основа здорового существования общества. Разрушение вековых ценностей, веры, отношения между людьми вплоть до полного отказа от семьи, такое было. Насаждение и поощрение до нас в западных странах уверен, что агрессивное вымарывание целых страниц собственной истории, обратная дискриминация большинства в интересах меньшинств или требование отказаться от привычного понимания таких базовых вещей, как мама, папа, семья или даже раз, различия полов, это, по их мнению, и есть вехи движения к общественному обновлению. Martin, that was a moral speech. Yeah. Does the papacy have an agenda to make the family the core of its moral issues? Oh, definitely. That's one of their main, that, that and the poor is their main focus. Social justice mm. and the family. Well, one of the issues around the family is time to rest and to communicate with one another. It's necessary for your health, it's necessary for your religious experience, it's necessary for your social experience. It's absolutely necessary that the family forms the core again of the base for all morality. Hmm? That's it. That's a papal issue. Does he sound like a King of the North proponent or a King of the South proponent? Definitely king of the north. I think he actually sounds more king of the north than some that we relate to king of the north. Ah. Uh, so if we divorce the countries now, as we have said, and we're looking at ideologies, then you can see that what he is saying is that we as Russia are not prepared to accept the liberal agenda of the world. That's it. Is that what he's saying? That's exactly what he's saying. Okay, let me repeat that. He's saying, we as Russia are not prepared to accept the liberal agenda of the world where everything goes, transgenderism, destruction of the family, moral values, we will have no part in it. Mm -hmm. Is that what he's saying? Yes. Okay. Now, who does he see as the powers that are introducing this liberal agenda. The ones that are ac actually supposed to defend it, the West. Uh -huh. So he's referring to the United States, he's referring to Europe. Yes, he's actually said the Christian countries have forgotten their Christianity. The Christian countries have forgotten their Christianity. And these countries are trying to expand and 
put their power base even into Ukraine, where they will then have their atomic weapons on his doorstep, mm -hmm. and he uses this as a as a weapon, a political weapon, to say, well, if America didn't want missiles in Cuba, I have the same right to say I don't want missiles in Ukraine, and if Ukraine says I'm going to join NATO, I'll take you out. Yeah, hmm? that's exactly what he's saying. But Martin, they're sitting at the same table, and they're talking mischief. You see. The problem is exactly what he said is what the Antichrist system, the papacy, is also propagating. All right. Now, let's just think about this a little bit. We're just speculating, right? But let us put it this way. There is the threat of this escalating into a nuclear war. Does anyone want to have that? No. No because that would mean the destruction of millions and millions of lives, right? So there is this terrible threat that is associated now with a religious moral dilemma. Who is the mediator who is being called to mediate in this conflict? The Pope. The Pope. It seems as if you cannot divorce him from the system, right? You cannot. Because the Bible tells us you cannot, in the end, especially in that verse that says they're sitting at the same All place. right, so this mindset that the moral issue, which is also associated with the papacy, although, by the way, the papacy doesn't have a very good track record when it comes to morality, does it? No. They but at least in their words, they have these sweet words, right, about the family and all of these things. There are many, many in the world that do not want to go along with any form of religious mindset. There are many living in China. There are many living in the Western world, all over the world, that have that mindset. But that mindset has to go. Would it be a useful thing to use even the fear of nuclear war to let it go? No, oh, they'll use any means. Any means. Mm. All right. He has arms. Doesn't it say it in the Bible? So he has military power at his command. Uh, is it only one side or both sides of the military power that he has at his command? Yes. Could he play them up against each other? Yes. Ordo ab cow. Is this happening at the moment? I think it is. Now, what, Martin, if the Russia says, I will not accept the Western mindset, and I'm prepared to push the button to prevent it. What if fear drives humanity to the point of compromise and says, let's give the moral values of the papacy a chance? Putin, would you accept that? And you know what? The, prob the problem that I see is it sounds good because it sounds, it sounds really biblical. Good. And it could prevent war. And how would it look if anyone wants to go against prohibiting war and even it's got moral values attached to it? All right. So even those in the West that are opposed to the union of church and state, if it can prevent this Holocaust, mm. wouldn't it be wise to give this power a chance? After all, this power portrays itself as so concerned about the poor uplifting the downtrodden and all it wants is to give the family its place back and uh, they don't realize that he's working against the holy covenant and setting up the abomination of desolation namely his moral authority over and against god's moral authority is that a possibility it is and now you've put into the mix patriotism so they a lot of people will support this also because if you're a patriot you understand that this is also morality in this patri patriotism that they support. Now, it's interesting to me that Russia is the one in the fray at the moment because Russia is a religious country. Yeah. All right. It had enforced atheism on it for decades, mm -hmm. but the Orthodox Church came out on top. 
But the Orthodox Church only came out on top once it had reached an agreement with the papacy. Yeah. Because communism is a papal invention. It was invented by the Jesuits, practiced in great detail in their reductions in South America, and then introduced via their agents, Karl Marx and all of those associated with him, and introduced into the Bolshevik Revolution. And you can actually deduce from what he said that he's against what the Bolsheviks and the whole communism era had portrayed. Okay. Now, Martin, also important is that the ships of Chitim or Kitim were involved, the economics. Mm. Again, can you separate it absolutely and say the economic power is only with the West and not with, not with the others? Not at all. Because they can also form a very powerful economic Especially block. Especially now. You cannot say that China is not a, a powerful economic entity. All right. So let's have a look whether they could perhaps be sitting at the same table. And I have to say... Um, when I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation, like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Pres of uh, Argentina and so on, is that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and I would know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are for our uh, actually young global leaders of the world economy right. form. And that's true in Argentina too. Wow. Yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the president, with a young global leader, but. So, Martin, he mentioned Putin as one of the team. Yes. So they're sitting at one table. France, Macron, Trudeau, he mentioned them all. If you want to have Ordo Abkau, you must always have an enemy even if it is a perceived enemy. So now, at the current moment, Russia is the great enemy. Maybe in the near future, when they need another one, China can be a very useful substitute as the enemy. But the idea is to create the order that they want, which is the new economic model order where the power is given unto the beast. Has the papacy spoken to all of the major economic uh, people in the world? Definitely. And organizations. COP26. All the COP meetings. Has it got the religious world in the bag through the ecumenical movement? Mm -hmm. Is it playing the political game absolutely in a masterly fashion? Oh, perfectly. Okay. So if we look at this article here, it states that Russian President Vladimir Putin meets with the World Economic Forum Chairman Klaus Schwab. That was in 2019. And uh, Russian President, President Vladimir Putin met with the World Economic Forum Executive Chairman Klaus Schwab in St. Petersburg. And this is what was said. We have always maintained relations with your forum that you founded and we will continue to support it. Of course, Russian representatives have always taken part and will take part in the events you hold. For our part, we are holding similar events, which of course aim to establish business contacts with Russia's partners above all else. You know, we are holding the St. Petersburg Economic Forum here in St. Petersburg, as well as in the Far East, in Siberia, and in Southern Russia, Putin said. Is there a close link? Definitely. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of speculation that Putin couldn't be, have been part of the young uh, global leaders. All right. But here he acknowledges that they have been al always been and are still part of this world. Very well. Now, 
if this is a game, sitting at the same table, to get the world out of fear of nuclear conflict to eventually embrace the moral superiority of the papacy, then the kings of the world will be giving their power unto the beast, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a prophetic picture that in view of our short chronology time frame would have to happen more or less now? Yes, and it will have to happen relatively fast. The last events will be? Rapid ones. Rapid ones. We've just moved from a major calamity mm -hmm. into the next calamity. Exactly. Now, let's have a look at the other role player, namely Zelensky. What is this picture at the top here? It's the World Economic Forum. Yes. Were the ships of Kitim very active here? Mm -hmm. So here we have a profile on the website of the World Economic Forum of Zelensky. So here it says that he's an actor, he's a screenwriter, he's a creative director, a stand-up comedy contest team, quarter, 95. Uh, he played the lead role in the Servant of the People TV series that won the World Fest Remy Award, USA 2016, and made the comedy film finalist shortlist of the Seoul International Drama Award, South Korea. The Servant of the People also won the Intermedia Globe Silver Award in the Entertainment TV Show category at the World Media Festival in Hamburg, Germany. But did he get uh, pretty universal exposure? Yes, he is actually a very well-known and popular actor. So did they raise his profile? Oh, definitely. He became, well, you can call it an idol. Now, Martin, when we look at politics, do actors play a large role? No. Oh for a very long time already. I mean, Reagan was an actor. Yeah. John Paul II, the Pope, was an actor. Didn't the present Pope also play in movies? Quite a few. All Jesuits are trained in Jesuit theater, after all. It's part of their game. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe what uh, the supposed Shakespeare wrote. All the, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Yeah. Right? On the 21st of April 2019, he won the regular election with 73.22% of the vote and on May 20, 2019, was sworn in as president of the Ukraine. So if they're all involved with the World Economic Forum and Putin is also involved, do they all know each other very well? I'm sure they do. Hmm? Are they perhaps sitting at the same table? Well, they're sitting at the same World Economic Forum table. Now, how does the world portray the issue at the moment? They're portraying Zelensky as this hero mm -hmm. who has his military gear on, who has his bulletproof vest on, and he's the one fighting in the street, keeping away this big monster which is called Russia. Yeah. I believe if Russia really wanted to, it would take two or three days and they would have it in the bag, right? Mm -hmm. But... They're dragging this out. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. We have to look not at the event, horrendous as it may be, mm -hmm. because the Jesuits say that the ends justify the means, even if it means a lot of collateral damage. That's it. And that means even if there's a lot of people that has to die. All right. Now, what have we ha heard in the media? Now, what did that verse say? Are they speaking truth or are they speaking lies? Lies. All right. So the verse says that there was a crack team that was sent to assassinate him, but it was foiled. Mm. So he's being played up as the hero. Yeah. How much is truth and how much is lies? We will only one day know. We will one day know. Yes, and if you take the video that we've shown first um, about that parliament member yes and there's the beauty queen that's armed and ready and fighting it's a lot of hype to he to portray them as heroes 
And so you only hear a one-sided set of heroes. The other one is, they're trying to portray Putin as the stoic, sitting in his office with his stern face, mm. etc., etc. But uh, the Bible tells me that the end game is based on lies. It's interesting. I was trying to search for some comments or any news of the Putin side, and there's none. You cannot find no, anything. There's nothing. I, I've, I'm, in, I'm in contact with a person that's in Russia, and most of their correspondents like, have been, are they shutting down these things? So you don't hear the other side. It sounds a lot like the, the pandemic situation. Well, you only hear one side of a story because that's the scenario that everybody has to be fed. All right, so let's just make sure. Here we have many pictures of Putin and the papacy. And it goes back in history because he was even involved in, with the previous popes, right? And yeah. all the way back to... John Paul II. John Paul II, all the way back. And uh, he's a very devout man because look at what he's doing right here. That's something that shows a certain kind of devotion that is not of an ordinary kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we cannot, in my opinion, place this man squarely in the King of the South category. Not at all. He's playing a game in order to get the mindset of the world to accept the moral authority of the Pope. Mm -hmm. Let's look further. What about the other side? Are they also associated with the Pope? Let's read. President Zelensky said on Twitter, thanked Francis at Pontifex for praying for peace in Ukraine and a ceasefire. The Ukrainian people feel the spiritual support of His Holiness. Both of them Sitting at the same table, Martin? Mm -hmm. Is this evidence? Or is this conspiracy? And if you take it into the biblical timeline, right at the end, both are associated with the papacy. Here is the religious news service from February 27, 2022. Pope Francis calls Ukrainian President Zelensky to express profound pain. In a tweet Saturday, the Ukrainian embassy to the Holy See said during the phone call, Pope Francis voiced his most profound pain for the tragic events unfolding in the country. The way in which they portray the Pope as this extremely concerned moral leader of the world. It's the latest effort made by the Vatican to show support and mediate peace in the Ukraine. Now, did he speak with the other side? Yes. As Ukraine bleeds, Pope Francis and Russian patriarch Kirill could be negotiators. Is this the church? That's it. And negotiating with the state? Mm -hmm. Martin, if the church starts negotiating with the state, and succeeds in brokering a ceasefire of any kind. Is the moral position of the church then elevated in the eyes of humanity? Definitely. Could it perhaps even go so far as to prevent nuclear war if only this moral authority received a little more recognition? We've been at this before. When Reagan and Pope John Paul spoke to Gorbachev, and if you go back to the quote of the Spirit of Prophecy, it said it was this bad situation, war, everything, then relative peace, and we are at it again. We are at it again. We've had a period of the so-called relative peace, but now we're at it again. I also find the timing very interesting. Mm -hmm. Immediately after one crisis, of a medical nature, a health nature, we're going into a political crisis that could lead to a spiritual elevation. It's amazing. And if you take it, would this have happened during the crisis, the medical crisis? It would, have, would not have worked, right? 
All right, so Biden versus Putin portends the non-negotiable collision course we are now witnessing, unless something truly extraordinary takes place. So they're living in a time of Lent, mm -hmm. this time of 40 days fasting. This is very interesting, which uh, is supposed to commemorate uh, the experience in the wilderness. Now Jesus did that fast for us, mm -hmm. and he didn't expect us to repeat it. So this is a very, uh, let me put it bluntly, paganized way of dealing with it because it adds your own element of works to already completed work that Christ achieved for you, right? Yeah, it's similar to what Luther had to do in whipping himself. In the yes. Let's read this sentence again because it's very important. Biden versus Putin portends the non-negotiable collision course we are now witnessing. In other words, there needs to be a mediator. Mm -hmm. So the king of the south mentality, which is very strong in Biden, has come up against a king of the north mentality portrayed strangely by Putin. Yeah. And it is non-negotiable. And it has a military connotation because Ukraine is in the fray. And the Western NATO powers versus this other power block. In other words, you cannot in this situation apply the label King of the North, King of the South to a country or political grouping. Exactly. Also not a person. It is a mindset mm. that must be conquered. And it is interesting that these two mindsets are in a clash. Now, unless something truly extraordinary takes place, hmm? and that will be a mind shift. That's it. A mind shift. In 2016, Pope Francis became the first Catholic pontiff to meet a Russian patriarch traveling to Cuba to meet the po person he called his brother. Ecumenism had brought them together. At first they were at loggerheads, and we know that the rift between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church comes over millennia. Yeah. So this has been resolved. So there is no conflict at the level of the Church. No, isn't it interesting, if you just take, for instance, <laughs> this Pope, Francis, what he's managed in that area of the different religions, even with the Grand Imam, all of this, he's the biggest peacemaker that this world has ever seen. Yes, I saw a video many years ago of the Orthodox patriarchs coming into the Vatican and every single one of them bowing down and kissing the ring of the Pope. Mm. Now, so that has already been achieved. So the question is, could Francis and Kirill now initiate a conversation focused on their shared spiritual values? Is there ground for one more inspired hand clasp between men of faith to restore peace? Church and state. Now in this negotiation, who is taking the chair? The Pope. The Pope. If they succeed by reaching into the heart of this standoff, it could bring us back from the brink and deliver the second greatest miracle in modern history. Martin, I believe the kings of the world, in order to avoid a nuclear calamity, will have to give their power unto the beast. Exactly. And once he has done that, what did the verse say? They will set up what? abomination of desolation ah isn't that what we've been speaking about for years that's it so pope in the middle of russia ukraine crisis he's in the middle the news tells us he's in the middle the papacy is back in global politics that is assuming it ever left martin this has been a game that has been coming a long, long time. 
The gesture by Pope Francis to visit the Russian embassy in Rome on Friday was undoubtedly a notable event for a variety of reasons. The Vatican has a centuries-old foreign service of diplomats and spies, think tanks and journalists. Nothing that the Pope does is ever coincidental. Martin, this is the Asia Times. It sounds like a reference from the Bible. Yeah, or the spirit of prophecy. There is also the ponderous Vatican bureaucracy which makes the decisions for the Pope. But interestingly, Francis's visit to the Russian embassy on Friday was not listed in his customary daily program sheet of engagements. So there are negotiations behind the scenes. That alone makes it an extraordinary hands-on papal gesture that has no recent precedent. The U.S. cable network CNN reported that the Pope spoke with the Russian ambassador for more than an hour and a half. Francis has called for the peaceful end of the conflict and is urging Catholics to set Wednesday aside as a day of fasting and prayer dedicated to peace in the Ukraine. Now, according to other sources, he actually spoke on the phone to yeah. Putin himself. So, is he taking center stage in the political drama? Definitely. All right, so let's look at Catholic culture. The ambassador, Ukraine, would welcome papal visit. Vatican mediation to avert war. The papal visit will have a very great impact for the development of the situation. And uh, let's see what they said. As I understand it, the Vatican would be ready and happy to create this possibility for meeting leaders from both sides. He added, Ukraine is completely in favor of this very influential, very spiritual place for a meeting. If Russia confirms its will to sit at the table, immediately Ukraine will respond in a positive way. So they are all willing. So at the moment it's happening telephonically through the various embassies. But he's taking center stage. So the Pope makes an unprecedented moves. He makes a personal appeal in remarkable Russian embassy visit. Pope Francis went to the Russian embassy on Friday to personally express his concern about the war in Ukraine in an extraordinary hands-on papal gesture that has no recent precedent Francis later assured a top Ukrainian Greek Catholic leader he would do everything I can to help. The head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, the largest Eastern Rite Church in communion with Rome, welcomed Francis's protocol-bending diplomatic intervention and said it hoped it would help dialogue prevail over force. His beatitude Shevchuk said the Pope later phoned him in Kiev and assured him, I will do everything I can. So here we have the church acting in unison together, using the papacy as the chair, mm -hmm. as the seat of the power, as the negotiators. Now, Revelation 17, 12 says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So now, this issue of ten horns. If you read the book of Revelation, the ten horns refer to the European powers and its affiliates. So one of the outflows of the ten horn powers is, of course, the United States of America mm -hmm. and any of the colonies in the world as well. There's also the other view that it's the ten regions in the world. If you stick to the purely biblical picture, could you read that the Christian powers which thou sawest, which have received no kingdom as yet, receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So they will give their power unto the beast. So, Martin, when they give their power to the beast, there must be some precedent that induces them to give that power unto the beast. Because the Constitution in the United States says that church and state must be separate. 
What tremendous calamity could make them say it is expedient that we give our power to the beast? To prevent a nuclear war. Aha. Is that a possibility? Just a thought? I think it's very possible. So who is being actually defeated? The mindset which says the church has nothing to do with the state. Correct. So that's actually the king of the south. That's the king of the south mindset. That has to go. And the force and the power of it must be so great that fear will be the weapon employed to induce humanity to embrace it. Correct. Did they do the same on the health issue? Yes. Isn't it a tactic that works very well it's for very them? working very well. We'll get to that. But it's also working on the climate change issue. Okay. Here's an article from the Business Insider where the European Commission chief says about the Ukraine, they belong to us. They are one of us and we want them in. They belong to us. They are one of us. We want them in, von Leiden told Euro News on Sunday. The Hill reported on Saturday that Zelensky pressed the EU as well as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization about Ukraine's membership status, asking for a firm timeline. Van Leyen told Euronews that the EU had a process with Ukraine that includes integrating the Ukrainian market in a single market and close cooperation on the energy grid. Now, if the other side says over my nuclear war body, would that be a reason to give the power unto the beast as a compromise situation? Yes, because it will create fear. Putin reveals plan to dominate Europe beyond Ukraine. Neighbors Finland and Sweden are also warned they will face military and political consequences if they join NATO. Now, those countries are already part of the European Union, but they're not part of NATO. That's a very interesting situation. So now he's threatening them. There seems to be this pressure from the Putin side to change the thinking of the Western world, to come more in line with the moral values of the papacy. Yes. And if this compromise could be worked and you could prevent nuclear war, who knows what will happen in the future? Maybe China will jump in. Who knows know. how great this pressure mm. will become? There's still, there's still another party there that can be used to ratchet up the pressure, right? Mm. Russia said if Finland and Sweden join NATO, there will be serious repercussions. That's a warning. Yes. Both of those countries have said they will ignore what Putin is saying. Intelligent officials are worried Kiev would fall within days of the intense fighting. The spokeswoman of Putin's foreign affairs said Finland and Sweden should not base their security on damaging the security of other countries. So they're playing a very clever political game. You know, and the other thing is it sounds similar to what happened with Hitler and the Second World War. So that again brings up this fear that's being driven all right, what was the response of Finland? Finland will today debate joining NATO despite threat from neighbors, Russia, that they will face military and political consequences. So they will debate this and they have reached 50,000 signatories. So if more and more countries want to join NATO, that would give more and more impetus to the possibility of a clash even of a nuclear nature. So we definitely need some kind of compromise. And Martin, it's not only Finland and Sweden. Kosovo asked the US for permanent military base and speedier NATO membership. Kosovo has asked the United States to establish a permanent military base in the country and speed up its integration into NATO after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Kosovo's defense minister, Ahmed Mihaj said on Sunday, accelerating Kosovo's membership in NATO and having a permanent base of American forces is an immediate need to guarantee peace, security and stability in the Western Balkans, Mihaj said on his Facebook page. So 
it appears as if the pressure is on Russia mm -hmm. and that NATO is making Putin desperate to the point of being willing to push the nuclear button. Mm. What a perfect situation to get a new world order. And as we said, the new world order is not just about economics because the Vatican controls economics anyway. It is about giving the power unto the beast. And this links on to that verse in Revelation where those kings get an hour of rulership with the beast. Now Martin, is this something that has developed now just suddenly out of the blue or has this perhaps been on the cards for a long time? No. If you go back, this has been coming for a long Didn't time. Didn't we just read in that article that the papacy plans long ahead? Mm -hmm. Now, in 2015 already, Gorbachev issued a warning that there could be nuclear war over the Ukraine. This has been planned for a long time. I think they've been sitting at a table for a very long time. In an interview with the German weekly news magazine Der Spiegel, 83-year-old former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev said the crisis in Ukraine could lead to large-scale war in Europe or even a nuclear war. We won't survive if someone loses their nerves in the current tension. So this is a game plan. This is a game plan. Here's an article in the Express from March the 2nd means war with Russia. Putin to face full NATO power this week if slaughter not stopped. So is there a threat from NATO? Yes, we've got both threatening each other. Okay, Vladimir Putin has been warned NATO could opt to intervene directly in Ukraine if public pressure to stop the slaughter of citizens were to grow further. So it this propaganda machine is doing a tremendous job here. Martin, do you think it's possible that some might think, well, you know, maybe Russia by itself can still be contained? Why don't we throw China into the mix? Mm. Would that be a more scary scenario? Definitely. What countries would then be threatened besides Europe? Asian countries. Okay. All the Asian countries. Australia and New Zealand, would they also come into the fray? Then that would be a pretty universal thing, right? So if you could have this added to the fray, then we are sitting, according to the media and according to the game plan, on a powder keg that could explode. Mm. So emboldened by lack of Western aid for Ukraine, communist regime declares Taiwan belongs to China. So this is the Christian perspective CBN News. In the immediate aftermath of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine on Wednesday, China's foreign ministry made an announcement. The communist regime declared to the world that it claims Taiwan to be part of China. The claim is similar to the excuse being used by Vladimir Putin as a pretext to invade and violently take territory away from his neighbor. So they have this backup that the war could escalate into a worldwide scenario. But it's always good to have a little bit of tongue-in-cheek in there. Here's uh, one of the cartoons that has come out. You're distracting Putin from something very important, says John Kerry. And his little sign is very interesting. It says, stop climate change, after having altered the term global warming, which just doesn't wash anymore. Mm. Because uh, that scientific scenario has gone out of the window a long time ago. So they're keeping this in the background as well as one of the reasons why you have to follow a particular game plan. Let's just backtrack. Climate change is not off the table. No, not at all. And it's also part of that discussion 
that takes place secretly associated with a lot of lies at that particular table where the king of the north and the king of the south sit and have their little chats. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, even Putin signed there and don't put China off. If you go back to those articles, they're also in there. They're all in there. So they've all signed those particular things. Now, what is interesting, climate change is also very much part of the papal agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the papal agenda is not being followed. It, let's put it this way. The script of the papal agenda is not being followed to the letter. It is given lip service but it's not followed mm -hmm. because the secular world hasn't given their power unto the beast. Mm -hmm. And let's check that out. Here is the article in the Jesuit Review. It's very important that these are the Jesuits speaking. These are actually the rulers of the world, though nobody wants to believe it. Mm -hmm. COP26 did not go far enough. It's time to take the Pope Francis' approach to climate change. You see the issue? Mm. COP26 climate summit in Glasgow was a tale of two cities, one afloat on bold pledges and new promises, the other sinking under the weight of Greta Mania and the chants of blah, blah, blah from the followers of the Swedish environmental activist Greta Thunberg. Not even Barack Obama celebrated oratory or a surprise U.S.-China cooperation pact could reconcile the differences. Now let's see what the issue was. To better understand the contrast, we can explore another pair of cities, Paris, where a climate accord was hammered out in 2015 versus Rome and its body of Catholic thought. They reveal vastly different perspectives on climate change. So do we have two mindsets? Yes. The issue is the same. Uh -huh. Climate change. That's it. But Pope Francis's climate agenda has a moral agenda attached That's to it. it. His approach is the one that has to be followed by the world. But the world is not following it. No. Is that a king of the north, king of the south clash? Yes. Okay. The Paris approach has everything backwards. It began with the scientific data of global warming and manufactured elaborate methods to stop it, never pondering the larger question to what ends. The moral issue. Rome or the Catholic Church begins rightly by defining life's purpose and then searches for socio-political structures that will get us there. Paris asks us to reason our way to ecological sustainability from an ideological starting point of planetary plunder. Rome encourages us to use Ignatian spirituality to seek God in all things while instructing us that we are all stewards of the earth. That is a mind-blowing statement. So here we have a moral issue, a religious issue, which the Paris Accord excludes. Yeah. So the Paris Accord is King of the South philosophy. Here the Jesuits are saying that's wrong. We need the moral issue. What morality? Ignatian spirituality. Martin, isn't that doing an injustice to the Holy Covenant? 100%. Oh, that 100%. is exactly the opposite. That's exactly the opposite. This is salvation by experience and salvation by works as opposed to salvation by grace and justification by faith. Right? Absolutely. So we have an injustice to the covenant. And that is what they want. Mm -hmm. But they're not getting it. Can they now use the threat of nuclear war in order to achieve that aim? Let's continue. Paris expects virtuous behavior from an anthropological premise 
that privileges self-interest and individual liberty. Secular mindset, king of the south philosophy. Rome understands that virtue flows from the pursuit of the common good defined by solidarity, charity, and the reciprocity. Solidarity. Fraternity. Did the papacy sign an, sign an accord with Islam on this issue? Yes. Is the Orthodox Church on board? Yes. Is the Protestant world on board? Everybody. So who's against it? Only the king of the South philosophy. Martin, the king of the South philosophy will have to go. Mm. It's mm. pushing against the king of the North. And the king of the North, according to the scriptures, will prevail. Mm. Okay. Rome, therefore, informs the climate change challenge on two levels. The epistemological, by properly framing the question and identifying the root causes of the problem. And the practical, by offering operational principles upon which socio-political solutions can emerge. The Roman document that most obviously serves as the counterpoise to the Paris Agreement is Laudato Si. Does that contain the abomination that causes desolation? Yes, and it contains the mark of the beast. Which is the abomination of desolation. Pope Francis instructs us that all things are connected and that climate change, social injustice and economic inequality are inextricably linked. Is the World Economic Forum involved? Yes. So whose side are they on? Uh, King of the North. Aha. Uh -huh. Throughout the encyclical, Francis explains how our idolatry of the machine and our unbridled pursuit of narrow self-interest crowd out any sense of justice and the common good. Roman Catholic social thinking has to be introduced into the world. Do you remember that book by John Robbins, which is called Ecclesiastical Megalomania? Yes. Remember that we discussed that on a WhatsApp prof? Mm -hmm. Perhaps people should look at that again. Yeah. I'll so put the link in again. Put the link into it. Then we can start seeing this picture forming. Martin, this is a prophetic picture that is so profound. So if we go to Daniel chapter 11 and we read further from verse 40. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. But Martin, they're sitting at the same table. Mm. So this is a historical event that happened when the papacy lost its political power, right? Yes. But Revelation promises that it will receive it back. Then we are told in the book of Revelation that this clash was also a north-south clash when the papacy lost its power mm. and that spiritually the king of the south was Egypt. Spiritually, spiritually. not literally yeah. anymore. So we cannot put it into a literal country. Yes, it's minds. It's minds that are clashing. So will there be another possible push at the end? Yes. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, that's using a war machine, Martin. Horsemen, that's a war machine. That's soldiers on the ground. Many ships, that's the economy. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So his mindset is going to win. Yeah. He has the military of all these countries at his command. And he's telling you lies and giving you propaganda to make you l believe a certain scenario. But the agenda behind it has to be studied in detail. I just want to also say here, uh, we don't know exactly what can happen. There can actually be maybe some nuclear bombs that goes off. But the end result will still be exactly what we've said the whole time. No matter how bad it becomes, the prophecy of the Bible will be fulfilled. And you know, Martin, what is, what is a great possibility is that 
all of these things might happen. And the Bible says that the abomination of desolation will be set up. And then there will come a time of trouble such as never was. Perhaps then the buttons can be pushed. Yes. But then it is too late yeah. because it's after the close of probation. Now we also had this terrible warning in Daniel 11.41. You shall also enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab and the chief children of Ammon. Now those countries are all descendants of Abraham. In other words, what it is saying, he will also enter the church, even God's church. But many will escape out of the Protestant world, out of the religious systems, and they will join. Now it's interesting that it also mentions Edom. In other words, many in the Islamic world will also come to a knowledge of the truth at the end. And it's already happening. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall gain victory over the secular mindset. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. He will control the economy. And over all the precious things of Egypt. In other words, that which was totally separated from the church will again be part of his treasury. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. In other words, all the nations will be in harmony with his thinking. So the king of the south mindset is thus overwhelmed by a massive final thrust by the king of the north who employs fear tactics, which is what we are seeing at the moment, induced amidst a chaos of wars and economic chaos. The military alliances forced by the king of the north serve to force the world to accept a collective morality which will be dictated by himself. Even the very elect are at risk here. Because it's very deceptive. That's it. It can swallow you in if you don't sit back and be an observer. The only way to get involved in this is to do evangelism. Now Luke 21, 26 says men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So Martin, if the powers of heaven are even shaken, then this must have a religious connotation, right? So what is coming upon the earth is going to be pretty dreadful, but we cannot stop it. And if we become involved on the level as the world is involved, we will miss the picture. A few years ago, I gave a lecture and I referred to two books. And uh, I just briefly want to mention them again. Two recent books attempt to explain the relationship between the Vatican and the United States. Each has a different agenda, and thus they reach opposite conclusions. Common to both, however, is a primary focus on the debate over the legitimacy of America's war in Iraq. The two books are Parallel Empires, The Vatican and the United States, Two Centuries of Alliance and Conflict, and Against the Grain, Christianity and Democracy, War and Peace. So these two books discuss basically this conflict between the two mindsets. Mm -hmm. They reach different conclusions and that's not important right now. But uh, Against the Grain is a book by George Weigel, who is a very prominent Roman Catholic thinker. Cutting against the grain of conventional wisdom, New York Times bestseller George Weigel offers a compelling look at the way in which Catholic social teaching sheds light on the challenges of peace, the problems of pluralism, and the quest for human rights and the defense of liberty. And he makes a strong argument that the world should embrace this morality. Mm -hmm. And the other book, Parallel Empires, the fascinating and highly relevant history of the turbulent relationship between the United States and the Holy See, recounted and analyzed by Italian journalist and Vatican insider Massimo Franco. And 
This is what the conclusion is. Parallel empires leaves no doubt regarding the impact that the struggle between these two great powers, one of secular might and the other of moral influence, has had on both our history and in today's world. So again, the issue of the moral influence of Rome is central to the debate. And Putin mentioned this moral dilemma. And there is a possibility of war if the world does not embrace a compromise. Yeah. And that compromise is in the morality of the papacy. Yes. Here's a quote from Testimonies, Volume 9. Spiritual darkness. This is a time of spiritual darkness in the churches of the world. Martin, have they swallowed a lie? Unfortunately, yes, because these propaganda machines are putting all this forward, so they're just swallowing it and choosing sides. So not only have they followed a false prophetic scenario, which is a Jesuitical scenario, this whole issue of rapture and dispensationalism and the centrality of a literal nation, when this mindset is a universal war in every nation and every human mind and heart. Yeah. Okay, So there's spiritual darkness. Ignorance of divine things has hidden God and the truth from view. The forces of evil are gathering in strength. Satan flatters his co-workers that he will do a work that will captivate the world. While partial inactivity has come upon the church, Satan and his hosts are intensely active. The professed Christian churches are not converting the world, for they are themselves corrupted with selfishness and pride and need to feel the converting power of God in their midst before they can lead others to a purer or higher standard. They're not going to go higher than the papal standard. No, because that's going to look like the biblical one. So they will miss the point. Mm -hmm. And they will reject what the reformers found and they will embrace a false science. So if we look at what Haggai has to say, then this will become abundantly clear. Let's just briefly look at what he had to say. This may well be the day that historians look back declaring that this was indeed the birth of World War III. History is repeating itself. Putin is doing exactly what Hitler did to get World War II started. Hitler declared to European leaders his need to invade Poland. Europe failed to respond, and the UK, under the leadership of its weak Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, bowed to Hitler's demands. The Iranian threat is real, and Iran must be stopped before these weapons become operational. Russia's military has been in the Middle East since 2015. Russia supports Iran, Iran trains, equips, and funds the terrorist armies of Hamas and Hezbollah who are begging for the green light to attack Israel with a nuclear weapon. People of America, our nation is in a severe crisis. Now is the time to show our strength. Our leaders must take their rightful place at the head of the international table. They must start believing the threats of our enemies and stop ignoring the plight of our allies. There is a great responsibility with being a great nation. At this moment, we are shirking that responsibility and abandoning our greatness. If we do not use our freedom to defend our freedom, we will lose our freedom. Martin, that was quite a rousing little speech. And uh, I think many people in the world will embrace his point of view. But that would make the Western powers the king of the north and the other powers the king of the south. Yeah. But I hope that we have shown that that cannot be the case. In other words, what he is portraying is the Jesuitical agenda for the end time yes. events rather than the biblical agenda where the papacy is the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And the war is a universal war, not focused on a literal country somewhere in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. 
This is actually a false prophetic picture which should be set straight. Yeah. All right, Martin. So when this king of the north finally gets what he wants, he gets his power back, the mortal wound is totally healed. Once again, he is the moral heart of the kings of the world. Then we read Daniel 11.44, Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Now we've discussed this before. The tidings out of the east is the warning against the second coming of Christ. The tidings out of the north, well he's the king of the north, why is he worried about the north? Yes, so there has to be another north. There has to be another north, mm. and that north is the throne of God. That's it. So this is the direct intervention of God in the affairs of men, and Christ will return from the east. This is the Advent message, the Advent message that warns that the time of his judgment has come, that Christ will return and that you should not accept the mark of the beast or you will obtain the plagues. This will be especially prevalent after the close of probation. Now, has the papacy already voiced concern about evangelists that use the media to proclaim messengers such as these? Yeah, yes. He has, right? Definitely. All right. Daniel 11.45, And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. It's a rather sad verse, right? Yeah. You were, what you were saying earlier, in, during the pandemic, if you were against the norm, you were labeled and ostracized. Now there's laws being written in that if you go against the narrative, then you are equal to a terrorist. That's a very sad state of affairs. So if we go to Daniel 11.45 and we look at them in the other translations, like the NIV or the, or the New King James Version, it says, He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and none will help him. And the New King James says he shall plant his tent of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Whereas the King James says in the glorious holy mountain. So he will even exert his influence within the church of God in the final days. This is something that we should be warned against. So Martin, we are living in very perilous times. And I don't know how others feel, but I feel that the final events are coming to fruition very rapidly. And this conflict, it's been dragging. Mm. And there are certain portrayals of heroes as we have seen. Why? Because this message has to come through that we need this moral mediation. And I believe that the kings of the world are on the verge or will be pressurized to give their power unto the beast, which they've probably done in secret already, mm. just to convince the mindset out there that this is absolutely necessary for universal peace. And then when they achieve it, they will shout, Peace, peace and safety. And safety. And what will happen? Sudden destruction. May God help us to reach as many people as we can mm -hmm. with the true gospel, the everlasting gospel, that we cannot give our power unto the beast and turn our efforts against the Holy Covenant. Mm -hmm. May God help us to set the record straight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the world is on the verge of the greatest deception in the history of humanity and the result will be devastating. Unless we embrace the truth and accept the fact that we have to separate ourselves from Babylon, we will be swept away in the whirlwind that is coming. 
Help us to warn the world and may you reach through your Holy Spirit all those that cling to you, that cling to salvation in Christ and Christ alone and believe the scriptures. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.